So Vatican II is really the first time where you would have uh, bishops, native bishops from all over the world uh, coming together. And so it started what I'm calling a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift in an understanding of the world, in an understanding of other faiths, in an understanding of conscience as our primary modality of being human. And Vatican II said that freedom of religion is an inalienable human right. Even if they, they might say, well, but you know, you're supposed to be Catholics, and the old thing was error had no rights. And Vatican II says, no, uh, people have rights, and you can't, you can't uh, divest them of that basic right. And so Vatican II, the big paradigm shift of Vatican II was that unity was not realized through uniformity. And all paradigm shifts take a while to really cement themselves. And I think we see that uh, going through uh, as well. So here, here are the popes from Vatican II uh, to the present. And here's um, some pictures of the popes. Now look at those pictures, because in a second I'm going to show you a different picture, which is going to show you at least sartorially uh, a different <laughs> paradigm shift. So we have John the 23rd being brought in at the beginning of uh, the opening session of Vatican II on the Assidia Gestatoria. And then you've got his successor, Paul VI, with the, the, uh, the papal crown, the triregnum, that you know, you're, you've got the, the ministry to govern, to teach, and to sanctify. And you've got your jurisdiction is earth, uh, purgatory, and heaven. And then uh, Pope, uh, Pope John Paul I was only 33 days, so he didn't get in here. But uh, John Paul II was 47 years. Uh, and while he was certainly uh, had very strong views on, on many things, he really did, I think, try to move some of these um, uh, paradigms forward. He refused ever to get into the stadia gestatoria, that little, uh, you know, um, a, a throne that was being carried on people's shoulders. Uh, Pope Benedict, uh, who succeeded him, also kept those things in, in line, but he, uh, I, I think he did like uh, ritual, uh, for ritual sake, I mean, he saw a value in it, and uh, he's, he liked a certain amount of ecclesiastical fine, finery. Paul. Oh. Um, John, uh, excuse me, Pope Francis, when he was elected, and this is in the lifetime of every one of us here, uh, and I remember I was uh, a go-to, I was teaching at Boston College at the time, and I was a go-to person for, you know, various, uh, 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 journalistic endeavors, and I was on the the uh, microphone with um, uh, NPR, and you, the, you know the Pope came out. I mean, excuse me, the Cardinal came out and said, you know, the formula, "Habemus Papam." You know, we have a Pope, and then they go through this long "Suamentissima Reverendissima," which is okay. Now, and then he gives the name in Latin. George, and the only thing I could think of at that time was Cardinal Pell, George Pell from Australia, which would have been a very different paradigm indeed. Uh, and then, <laughs> then he says, but you know, Cardinal Bergoglio, who was a Jesuit, I'm a Jesuit, so I happen to have recognized that, but we didn't know what he would be like. And he came out, and for those of you that maybe had seen this or remembered, he came out with really a different paradigm. He did not come out with the uh, papal finery. He came out with the white cassock, which originally was a Dominican cassock. He didn't change his pectoral cross. He had his pewter pectoral cross, which he had as the Archbishop of Buenos Aires. And before giving his first blessing, Urbi et Orbi, to the city of Rome and the world, he said, before I bless you, I'm going to kneel down and I want you, you all, to bless me. And that was really, uh, that really was a paradigm shift. And the, the, uh, the master of ceremonies who was behind him uh, said sotto voce, but not too sotto. 
I said, Questo è il fine del mondo. This is the end of the world. <laughs> because of what this Pope, who's been Pope for, you know, 30 minutes, has done. Uh, well, you know, for him, it probably was the end of the world, and the world will take a long time uh, to end. So, Pope, Pope Francis was talking about the church has to be a church that goes out to the margins. It can't be sitting there in, in splendid isolation uh, in, uh, in St. Peter's or any other cathedral. And then some of his famous sayings, I'm sure most of you have heard the saying, who am I to judge? That's what he said in response to a, a question in a, a, on a plane ride home from someplace that he was in. What had happened was that a papal nuncio, an archbishop, had uh, been uh, outed. He'd been, uh, uh, he, was, he was gay and, and this was made public and they were asking, well, what about Archbishop so-and-so? And he said, who am I to judge? And he's not saying everything is fine. He said, but that's not my role. My role is not to pass judgment. So I would say that the, the answer to his question, who am I to judge, is a different question. And that's how am I to judge? How are we to judge? So he was using in his ecclesiology, he talked about the church as a field hospital, uh, with a mission to the wounded, the vulnerable, the marginalized. And he asked the church leaders, the bishops, to have the smell of the sheep. I think this is one of the things that is most difficult for many of the bishops to really right. internalize, right. that they are going to have the smell of the sheep. Right. And the other thing for my area is moral theology or Christian ethics. He clearly has underscored pastoral gradualism that we don't reach you know, the end, all of the beginning, uh, but it takes time and we have to take people where they are and move forward with them, rather than standing out ahead of them and say, here I am, you come to me. So just a few days after he was elected Pope in March of 2013, the church celebrated Holy Week and throughout history, it's always been, been done at St. Peter's uh, in Rome. But for Holy Thursday, he went to a juvenile prison in Rome, and he uh, washed the feet of 12 people to symbolize the 12 apostles, but men and women. And that was a violation of liturgical law at that time. Now, the Pope is is in charge of all of liturgical law. So if the Pope does something that's against liturgical law, it doesn't apply to him because he's the source of it all. But he, he washed the feet of juvenile detainees, including women and including a Muslim. So this was really a paradigm uh, uh, shift. And then his favorite, <laughs> uh, he doesn't have the big limo, uh, Pope John Paul II had a nice uh, Mercedes. Uh, it, it was, you know, it wasn't 10 feet long, but well, maybe it was 10 feet long, but it wasn't 30 feet long. Uh, but Pope Francis explicitly has taken this Fiat as his uh, vehicle of choice. And just in case uh, you don't know, Fiat is the Latin word for let it be done. So Fiat. Uh, and he has the, uh, the license plate SCV1. Now, SCV stands for, in Italian, uh, the Vatican City State. But the Romans always had this joke about SCV, the Vatican City State. And in Italian, they would say SCV stands for Se Cristo Videsse, which translates into English as if Jesus only could see what's going on. Uh, so, say, we still be death, say, I think Jesus would smile. And these are just some little, um, you know, some little uh, photo clips of Pope Francis in action. My favorite one is actually this one here. I don't know if you can figure it out, the, the, the woman in white. He was doing a blessing, kind of like a mass wedding, so several wedding couples. And this bride 
seem to be, uh, you know, somewhat along uh, the path of pregnancy. And so rather than say, my goodness, what is she doing here? He reaches right out and touches her and blesses her. And I think that that is a good example of fratellanza. Uh, Pope Francis's encyclical, uh, the last one that he has done at least so far, um, in 2020, he signed at um, the uh, Basilica of uh, St. Francis in the town of Assisi. Assisi is a beautiful town, it's, it's, I mean, it's a tourist attraction, but they don't have any industry, so it's nice and clean, and it really is a place to go. So uh, Francis himself is legendary. So we say, why, why did he choose the name Francis? Why did he use this fratelli tutti? He was invoking the myth, the legend, of Francis, and here's just a few little things of the legend of Francis. Here you got Francis the ascetic meditating on a on a, uh, on a, a skull, and uh, this is a painting by Benelli. Here is the cross in the little chapel of San Damiano, which is near, uh, which was just outside of Assisi, and that's where Francis, the young Francis, had gone to pray, and he heard the cross saying to him, "Francis, my church is." is falling down, rebuild it. And he thought he meant, you know, uh, to do a little upkeep on the Church of San Damiano. So he, he did work on rebuilding it, but then he came to realize that what, uh, what the Lord was asking was to rebuild uh, a whole church. So here we've got uh, the Franciscans um, uh, with the cross in the background. And you see them with their Franciscan robe. But this is Francis's real robe. Now if you look at that, and it's conserved, you can see it if you go to a CC. If you look at that, you would probably say, this looks like something that a hippie might wear. Because Francis really was a boundary breaker. He wasn't going to be constrained by uh, uh, uniformity. Now I'm just putting this out here. This is the structure of Fratelli 2D. We don't have time to go into it in any great detail, but that's, that's what the different chapters are looking like. Uh, some of the key things that he highlights is the globalization of the challenges to Fratellanza, which this term that he has uh, popularized, the globalization of indifference. The indifference to the needs of our sisters and brothers has now become global. He brings up polarization. He highlights individualism as a cause or a, a, a symptom of this uh, indifference. Lack of respect for views of others, even if they are different, if they're uh, different, but to see them as legitimate. And then I, I have put out there a concordance. I've made a concordance of Fratelli Tutti. So when he's, I'm just gonna flash through here uh, some of the different little uh, sound bites from Fratelli Tutti. Uh, he's saying uh, that what we have to do is, the English says, love the brother. Actually, the Italian doesn't say that. The Italian says to love l'altro, and l'altro is, is literally the other. And so it's as the other, that's who you have to, that's who you love. If you, put, if you translate it as brother, you're missing that nuance. Uh, I wasn't in charge of the translation. Uh, uh, so for tell, uh, fraternal openness, the vision of St. Francis is concrete and universal towards fratelli, uh, fraternity. So St. Francis of Assisi was universal in many ways, but he did it always in a concrete method. And we got here, uh, using the, the Good Samaritan, the dignity of the human person, and this going out to the other. So if we look at it, Pope, uh, excuse me, at St. Francis's life, I think this is my favorite image of uh, what that uh, would be captured by, you know, in one picture, where Pope, where, excuse me, where St. Francis goes out to Egypt to meet the Sultan. And the Sultan initially thought, well, are you trying to convert to Islam? No. Well, if you're not going to convert to Islam then, and you're here, then you should be 
executed. That's what the religious law said. But he said, well, we are not going to execute you. So there was, you know, a little paradigm shift at the other end as well. Pope Francis, in some of his writings, in Fratelli Tutti and uh, Evangelii uh, Gaudium, which, which came before, he uses a model of what he calls a cultural polyhedron. Now, I have to be honest and tell you, I never knew what that was until he used it. But it's the thing on the right. And the thing on the left is the, the traditional pyramid with the Pope at the top and laity at the bottom. And he's saying this isn't the way the church should be. The church should be this cultural polyhedron where all of the interconnections uh, uh, fit together and are interconnected. For those of you that might be uh, familiar with Buddhism, this is very similar to the Buddhist concept of the net of Indra. And I'm not going to go into that. If you know Buddhism and you know that, then you know what, I mean, what I'm saying. Okay, so he's talking about the, the, what we should be creating is a many-faceted polyhedron and that everyone that has, has a place to play in the construction and the maintenance of this, uh, of this model. And can't, you can't take away one or the other and you can't say, well, this one's at the top and this one's at the bottom. Human rights and common good are two important uh, themes here. Uh, by saying that you have a right to religious liberty, this is an important paradigm shift because then it makes that old bromide of error has no rights, it subverts it. It says even error has rights because people who hold this have the rights and so the error itself has a certain amount of rights. And then he's talking about the creation of universal destination of created goods. We got solidarity, social friendship. Uh, now, bringing it home. Clearly, we have a ways to go. So uh, that great uh, uh, vehicle of truth, Twitter or, or X, whatever they're calling it uh, in this week. Uh, so they, uh, Fratelli Tutti, uh, has been denounced by many of, of the Uber Catholics saying that it is uh, a special kind of cancer uh, and that Pope Francis is clearly an heretical pope. I had put out on Twitter, I don't, you know, I've got maybe 3,000 followers, which in Twitter dumb isn't very many, uh, but I put out that I was making this presentation uh, today at the Parliament of World Religions and this was the good wishes that uh, one of the people tweeted in response to my presentation that I was overdue for an early grave. And I, that, that, I mean, that's true. I'm too old to die young. Um, so uh, uh, let me conclude with uh, St. Augustine his guideline on fratellanza and judging prudently. He says, in matters of faith, we have to have unity, but in matters of doubt, we have to have freedom. But in everything, we have to have charity. Uh, and Fratelli Tutti ends with this sort of interreligious prayer for unity, uh, which I, I think uh, is something that virtually everyone should be able to vocalize, should be able to pray, to pray, and as a Jesuit, I have to uh, give at least a, a nod to another Jesuit, Jared Manley Hopkin, uh, the Victorian British poet. He says, the just man justices keeps grace, acts in God's eyes, for Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his, to the Father through the feature of men's spaces. And I think that that's where I could end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father Jim. Now I think we have time for questions. Uh, our plan is to finish at 12. Uh, now I'd like to get your questions. Any questions, please? And if you have any, come up to the mic and maybe briefly identify yourself. 
and the verdict is really clean. I love it. Thank, thank you both very much for your uh, presentation. I was curious, could you, oh sorry, you asked for that. And uh, My name is Sadia Ahmad, um, from the greater Boston area. Um, I'm wondering if each of you can talk a little bit, obviously you're supporters of interfaith dialogue, how each of you have dealt with within your own faith community when people disagree or think it's heretical. When people, how have you personally dealt with that, responding to that? Curious to hear that from each of you. Well, for, for myself, I started, I said at my introduction, I started my teaching career at Sodak University in Seoul, Korea. It's a Jesuit university, but it is very reflective of the Korean population, which means the vast majority of people are not Christian, certainly not Catholic. Probably they would be Confucian in culture and Buddhist in religious practice. And so my first experience was trying to teach theology in that sort of a real, inter-religious inter context. So I don't see uh, other religions that would have you as a threat, but more as an opportunity. You know, in the Islamic tradition, there are many references that is uh, basically promoting dialogue. If you look at the Quran, uh, you will see those references. Uh, of course, there are Muslims who will understand differently, will interpret differently. They would say, well, if you are approaching Christian, that means you are becoming Christian. Or you are approaching Judaism, you're becoming a Jewish. Uh, Islam is not saying that actually, but there are some uh, Muslims who would be against dialogue. Not many, I would say, but there are. Uh, we have evidences in the Quran and in the sayings of the Prophet that dialogue is necessary. And one of my articles that I wrote uh, on Muslim-Christian relations, uh, I remember there was a gentleman who, once I gave a talk, I think it was in Minnesota, and he said, there is a verse in the Quran, it says, don't approach Jews and Christians. Not, uh, 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 now the verse says, uh, "Don't make Jews and Christians friends." I cannot accept dialogue," he said, "you know, in the gathering." And I said, "Well, I respect your opinion, but can you bring an evidence from the Quran that this verse is meant by you know what is saying about this verse is if that is the meaning of that verse." And I said, uh, have you read Nursi? He said, no, I haven't. I said, I wrote, I wrote an article on this, and please read it and then uh, get back to me if you have some, some thoughts on that. And he read the article that I just mentioned, uh, an Islamic social policy towards the people of the book. And Nursi interprets that Quranic verse. And he said, the lady he sent him mess, a message, said, I apologize, I didn't know that way. Uh, so, there are some Muslims really out of ignorance. They don't know the meaning of the verse. They just look at the literal meaning. They don't have any access to Islamic references, Islamic sources. Uh, but once it's explained, I think it is better understood. <coughs> I pass down the line of shared values. Thank you to both presenters, although I missed most of Dr. Sertoprak's presentation. Uh, but my question is partially answered by Dr. Sertoprak. My question is, uh, we have these, uh, in the scriptures, uh, the concepts and approaches uh, that, we, that we understand to be uh, facilitating, encouraging dialogue and friendship uh, collaboration. Uh, but where do you see this trickling or being taught, uh, you know, reaching uh, the masses? Uh, or, or not. So how do you see the situation of these teachings, lessons being uh, spread or, or being uh, not really seen? Well, one of the 
one of the observations I make is we still have a long way to go. Uh, in the era of uh, Donald Trump, um, whom I'm sure you've all heard of, uh, <laughs> uh, his great support amongst evangelical Christians now is being discussed and debated within that evangelical uh, tradition. And uh, uh, what I think his name is Russell Moore has said, there's something wrong with the way in which uh, evangelicals are, are adopting the value system of Donald Trump, especially in terms of exclusion and violence and what have you. So they said, and he, he was quoting, Jesus says, sir, on the mount to these people. And he said, well, that was from a different era. That, that can't refer to us. That's, that doesn't deal with the real world. He says, well, that is the world in which Jesus is asking us to live as disciples. So what, what are, are you going to conform the gospel to your values or vice versa? And that's been a longstanding uh, tension. But that's where, that's where we have to go, and I think we have to call it out for, for what it is. So that's my quick answer. I think the to make this well-known, that was your, your question, how can we make this uh, well-known by people, especially lay people in society? Uh, I think to, through publication, through social media, uh, I personally uh, write and share with people. Uh, JCU has about 10 of my articles. Just recently they sent me a message that they said 8,500 downloads happened in the last few months. So this way you may actually be able to spread the word. And what you are saying is not uh, against the Quran actually it is uh, part of the Quran. It's part of the Sunnah of the Prophet. And uh, if you understand these major Islamic sources accurately, uh, I think that will be the problem will be solved to a certain extent. Uh, we are living in the era of mass communication. I don't know how much uh, this mass communication can help with this. Um, I remember. Uh, uh, Father uh, Jim mentioned uh, to NPR, uh, we had, uh, who is now a cardinal, uh, Father uh, Fitzgerald, Michael Fitzgerald, uh, who was teaching a course on the Quran at, uh, um, at John Carroll. Now, uh, a father, an archbishop at that time, is teaching a course on the Quran, so it became a big news. <laughs> They asked me, uh, an NPR person, Tom Jelton, asked me uh, on NPR, said, what do you think? You know, a, a, a Christian bishop is a Catholic bishop is teaching the Quran. And I said, and that was actually nationwide in the whole nation, people from California calling me, said, you are on, on, on NPR, you know, it became like a big news. I said, in Islam, expertise is important, not the person. Father uh, um, Michael Fitzgerald has expertise on the Quran. He studied the Quran, he studied Islamic, Islamic tradition, and he has that knowledge. So why not? I said, he can teach something about the Quran. And I said, I prefer Father uh, um, Fitzgerald's way of teaching rather than a member of ISIS teaching the Quran. Because a member of ISIS is really misinterpreting the Quran. But I, I, know, I know that this person is expert on it, as he, he knows what he's saying. So it became a big news. Uh, American Academy of Religion put on their, uh, on their tweet. Like, uh, so this type of things maybe will actually overcome some prejudice uh, based on basic Islamic sources. So the knowledge, the Quranic verse says, uh, those who are knowledgeable, you know, they are not saying those who are no, have no knowledge. If the person has knowledge, you don't look at 
that person, who is that person, or ethnicity of that person, he has that knowledge and he is uh, capable to use that knowledge in his teaching. That way, I think we can uh, make the work much more better spread. Yeah, a comment? Just a comment. Uh, this is Imam Bitullah, uh, I'm uh, from Respect Islamic Graduate School. I'm maybe one of the uh, unique Imam who read uh, Women Fraternity document in his khutbah as a, uh, a weekly sermon, I think. The both sides, uh, Catholics and Muslims, uh, we just take this document, this uh, encounters of the Pope Francis and uh, saying really is happening, what happened in the history uh, with uh, Sultan al Malik uh, and Pope Francis went to Egypt and they have very far away from that unique encounter Sultan al Malik and Francis. Uh, they have been a great job and Muslims, they don't know that uh, Christians, uh, Catholics especially, uh, it's staying up in the uh, academic world. I think we have to go to churches and the uh, mosques and to to deliver because one of imam and the other is pope and they sign that human document uh, human fraternity document which give life to fraternity tutti so i think we have a great job to do may god help us to do it Hello, my name is Ahmed. I am a volunteer member of Niagara International uh, Inter Faith uh, Dialogue uh, Foundation. Uh, my one of our speakers talked about brotherhood in the under the name of uh, Tikhan and Fratalanza. Uh, so you both mentioned every moon, uh, mountain, even mountain can be a uh, brother of a human, and you said uh, loving the others, not the brothers. But I also realized that you both emphasized the word uh, believers during your uh, presentations. So my first question, uh, does the uh, term of brotherhood uh, cover non-believers too? And the second question, uh, what do we think that will happen after death in the ethnic hereafter? Uh, in other words, the non-believers and my last question, are we doing or should we do anything about our non-believer brothers and sisters in terms of saving their other groups? So uh, to answer uh, that question, I go back to Francis of Assisi when he was never ordained a priest, in case you didn't know that. <laughs> uh, and he preached he started preaching to the, to the animals. And I think that that's a good paradigm for going out to everyone. So he didn't, he didn't start out preaching to the believers or lapsed Christians or anything else. So all of creation is an object of, of his concern, of his uh, evangelization, if you will. Pope Francis, with his metaphor, of the church as a field hospital going out to the wounded. He doesn't say, well, just the wounded who are Christians. So that really is everyone who is wounded in one way or another, marginalized, and that would certainly include uh, non-believers. Now that was not emphasized perhaps as much in the two previous pontificates, but that's certainly what, what he would say. Now, your other question of what, what happens to people after they die, that's a very complex question. As a Jesuit, I can give you the quick answer of Karl Rahner, who's a Jesuit theologian, and his notion of what he called the anonymous Christian. It's an infelicitous term, but what he's basically saying is, and Matthew 25 uh, underscores that, everyone who does good for a sister or a brother whether or not they have a, a church membership card is then acting as uh, the righteous. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, now, from an Islamic perspective, there are two ways of approaching 
uh, non-believers, generally and individually. Now, generally in the Quran, uh, first of all, the Quran addresses all human beings. The major addressings of the Quran are saying, Ya Ayyuhan Nas, O human beings. So believers, non-believers. There are some verses that says, O oh, believers. But there are many verses who are saying, O oh, human beings. So if we make uh, a pyramid of brotherhood, the first level, let's say, you are blood brothers. You are brothers, per se, you are brothers. The second, maybe, you are brothers in faith. And maybe the third, you are brothers in humanity. Brothers, I mean sisters, too. You are brothers in humanity. So that non-believer actually is your brother in humanity. And maybe the, the fourth will be brother in creation. Your creator is one, so a part of nature. Nature world is also is a part of that brotherhood system. But when it comes to the eternal happiness, eternal uh, in the in the in the in the hereafter in the uh, in the realm of eternity, believers will be in paradise. Generically, we can say, non-believers will not be in paradise because they don't have pass to get into paradise. That path is faith. If you don't have pass or passport. Uh, you will not be able to enter paradise in the Islamic teaching. Generically, you can say that. It's what in the Quran. But individually, you cannot say that. Individually, for example, this person is not believer, he will go to hell. No, you cannot say that. In Islam, you cannot say that because you don't know. Maybe you, as a believer, will go to hell and he will go to paradise. Because maybe this person at the end of his life will be a believer and you at the end of your life, you will be non believer So do not judge people, individual. And that's principle in Islam, do not judge people. Imam al-Ghazali, very famous, uh, says, do not make yourself or claim that you are better than an atheist. You don't know if that atheist will be, if that Atheist will become a believer and you will become an atheist at that. And the point is that the end, the end, the final moment is the most important one. You are driving to Chicago and uh, before the last exit, you make an exit. You don't reach Chicago and you don't reach your goal. So that accident is something that happens to you before you die. And actually, it changes your faith. It changes your, your approach to God. And then finally, you become an atheist. I met with a person who has been a believer, a Muslim, maybe for over 40 years. And now he says, all these are jokes. He's not a believer now. So it is, it is not, there's no guarantee that you will become you will be a believer throughout your life. And therefore, you should be humble. You should not uh, uh, make kind of yourself superior to others. And therefore, uh, you may be in paradise and you may not be. Always you will ask God for, uh, for goodness. I think I have an answer. Why can't you question? If I could please, all the time. To you can oh, argue right away. I think people think to rule. Yes? Probably, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I'd like to ask a question about Mary, uh, because she's in both like, these wonderful scriptures. Um, I'm doing a presentation tomorrow on called Mary Under Occupation. It's a film. Uh, but I'd like to hear from the two of you about Mary, mother of Isa, Maryam, the mother of Isa, uh, and the mother of Jesus, uh, do you see her as a bridge for interfaith dialogue? 
Well, as a Catholic, today is August 15th, the Solemnity of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, where she was assumed body and soul into heaven. There's the bridge concept as far as I can see, because we do believe that everyone is destined for the fullness of life after this life, and she is the first fruits of that. Uh, your question is an interesting one, which I have never thought about before, so I'm going to give the mic over to Zeki now. It was good. <laughs> the answer is yes. Yes, Mary is really very important personality for Muslims and Christians. Uh, I, mean, I, I don't like to get into the details uh, because I wrote an article uh, called Mary in Islam and published by Oxford University Press, a uh, handbook on Mary. So a chapter there is on Mary in Islam. I will refer uh, you to that article and it's available online. It's available just in search. You'll find it as a PDF. Basically, uh, Mary is very much revered in the Islamic tradition to the extent that some Islamic scholars would call her a prophet, prophetess, a female prophet in Islam. So Mary is, uh, is an important bridge between uh, Christians and Muslims, I would say. Yes, actually, next, my foundation. My question is to you, I can understand what does the smell of the sheep and why people are ag and like against it, kind of. Are you asking why people are against yeah. it? Yeah. Well, I think if you could go back to, uh, if you can remember that pyramid model of the church, you got the pope, you got the bishops, you got the priests, uh, you have the religious bound, you know, men and women, and then the laity. And so you would understand the leaders of the church are the most privileged, the most entitled, and everything is, is moving up. And Francis is trying to turn that uh, pyramid around, if you will, and say, if you're gonna be a leader, uh, then you have to go out to all of these people where they are, in whatever conditions they are. And if you're gonna shepherd the sheep, you can't do it with drones. Uh, you're going to have to get out there and to be with the sheep, and that means that I, you know, you have to dress appropriately. You know, the, the gold brocade coat is not good attire for shepherding sheep, and you're going to get dirty and smelly, and that's what uh, that is not. Uh, that's really a sign, a confirmation that you're doing the right thing in the right way. We, uh, we have 90 seconds left, so one 30 second question. Well, thank you all so much for coming. It's been a pleasure to be here.